Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. Today I'm recapping our last live show, episode 31 of Badge of Honor. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. This week we're changing things up, swapping the order of our segments so that the main topic hits earlier. Don't worry, for those of you who enjoy our reviews and weekly look back at the games we played, it's still there, just after the main topic and the announcements. This week we're talking about flying the gamer geek flag and wearing the tabletop badge with honor. Times have changed. It used to be that being a gamer was anything but cool. Being a gamer meant being an outsider. Despite that, I've always been one to wear my hobby with pride. I didn't hide the fact I was a gamer. I carried my Warhammer rulebook with me openly, I had Futhark runes written on my denim jacket, and I owned a lot of gamer tees. Today, being into games doesn't mean you have to be a pariah. Now being into gaming isn't even just normal, it's often considered cool, and I gotta say I'm still trying to get my head around that. Now one of the benefits of this culture change is that it's now easier than ever to fly your gamer geek flag. Now why should you do that? Well, you should never be ashamed of the things you love. Part of being a fan of a thing is celebrating that thing and letting the world know you love it. Being proud of your hobby and showing it off is one thing, but the main reason I like to fly my flag is to silently signal other gamers. It's a way of letting other hobbyists know that we have something in common. Now this could just lead to a polite nod to each other as we pass on the street, but it could also lead to meeting up with an awesome new local gamer, someone you could end up playing games with for years. It might even just lead to a new lifetime friendship. So what are some ways you can show off your gamerness? Well, one of the most common ways is by wearing it on your sleeve. Literally, t-shirts have always been a thing with fans. Most of the shirts I own come from a few online shops. ThinkGeek.com has a ton of awesome geeky shirts, some that are directly tied to gaming. I own quite a few of their shirts, though I gotta admit I wait till they're on sale to buy them. Now, I also have picked up more shirts from Geeky Goodies, uh, probably more than I have from ThinkGeek. Chris Cormier has a great selection of gaming shirts, including some licensed ones for various game companies and podcasts. Speaking of podcasts, my co-host Sean gets many of his shirts from Teespring. Though he does have a warning about shopping for t-shirts online. Beware of online stores selling shirts with unlicensed intellectual property on them. Here we're all about supporting content creators. Don't support those sites. Now, if you don't like any of the shirts you do see online, you also have the option to go and make your own. Head over to Cafe Press, click on Design Your Own. Or head over to Arts Cow, who also has Design Your Own t-shirts. But again, be aware of copyright and intellectual property. Don't use other people's designs for your projects, even just for yourself. Reach out to the creator. They may say go ahead, or they may be able to point you to somewhere you can already buy their merch. Now, another way to fly the flag is to carry it. Gamer luggage is a thing. One of the best things I ever bought at Origins was a handy haversack from Offworld Designs. Besides being a great bag to carry around at a con with lots of room to hold games, it's great for showing off my gamerness. I've also got a backpack of holding from ThinkGeek. Now this is fantastic for RPG night. It fits a good chunk of rule books and has plenty of pouches for things like dice, pencils, and miniatures. Now, while not instantly recognizable as a piece of gamer gear for most people, I've got to give a shout out to the Quiver from Quiver Time. This is an awesome piece of gamer luggage designed for carrying card games to and from game night. Now, another thing you can do is add bling to the stuff you already own, say by putting a pin in it. While we were at Origins 2018, I discovered Pin Bazaar. This is a cool scavenger style hunt that ran throughout the entire con. You signed up at customer service, they gave you your first set of pins, and then you went around the dealer hall trying to find participating vendors and collecting more pins. Now, Sean noted that pin collecting at major events and conferences is a huge deal and something that he's been running into for years. There's actually a term, I guess, for hardcore collectors. They call themselves pinners. Guess it's a very big business, and full sets of pins can go for very big money. Now, since Origins, I've gotten pins from podcasts I enjoy, from cons I've attended, companies who games I dig. Besides picking them up at cons, I've also found a ridiculous number of very cool pins on Etsy. Now, another option that other than pins are patches. Similar to pins, you can find a growing number of great gaming-related iron-on or so-on patches out there. Now, I've got some really cool OSR RPG patches that from uh, Thaddeus Moore, who you can find on social media and just sells them directly. But if you're looking for gaming patches of your own, again, I'm going to point you to Etsy for a large selection. 
Now I gotta say, the easiest way you can let the world know you're a gamer is tell them. Shout it out. If your Facebook feed is all about your pets, kids, and your latest culinary collection, how about taking part in What Did You Play Mondays? Once a week, share what games you played the week previous. Or share a picture of your latest game on Instagram. Check in on Foursquare when you stop at the local game store. Heck, connect your Board Game Geek account to Twitter so that it shares your games whenever you play them. Now those are some of the things you can do to signal to the world that you're a tabletop gamer and proud of it. What I want to know is what you do. What do you do to fly the gamer flag? Let us know in the comments. And remember to check out the full podcast for a more in-depth discussion on this topic. Now I've got one quick announcement and that's it this week. Breakout Con this month. It's now March. Sean, Deanna, and I will all be there. You should be too. It's a fantastic smaller con in Toronto, Ontario, running from March 15th to 17th. Tons of RPGs, both indie and trad, and a huge board game room and library. For more info, go to breakoutcon.com. This week, we've got a special review from Sean. As of the new year, he's now become one of us, one of the tabletop gamers who log our gameplays. Now, I do this through Board Game Geek, but Sean is using an app called Board Game Stats. This episode, Sean reviews that app and tries to sell me on why it's better than just using Board Game Geek. The app is available on iOS and Android. It's a paid app, but only costs $2.99 US. Sean notes the interface and user experience are top-notch and deceptively simple to learn and use. Once you start adding data, it syncs up with your existing Board Game Geek account. Now, Sean is using it to not only track game plays, but also where he played, who he played with, and the scores each player had. I've got to admit, it looks pretty solid. For the full review, check out the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Episode 31, A Badge of Honor, which goes live at Tuesday at 2 a.m., both here on YouTube and on your favorite podcatcher. Another change to the show and also on the blog is that we're going to be separating out the weekly Gloomhaven update from the usual Tabletop Gaming weekly segment. So last Friday, we were a player short again. Tori felt his bachelor party was more important than gaming. So what that meant is another random dungeon, a three-player one with my cry card, Deanna's Mind Thief, and Cat's Spellweaver. Now during this game, our prosperity went up, and I wanted to spend a minute on that. As you do things in the game, the prosperity of the town of Gloomhaven can increase. Thematically, this means the town gets bigger, more people move in, new shops open, etc. Mechanically, it means two things. For one, if anyone starts a new character in the game, they start at a level equal to the prosperity. The other thing that happens is new item, items are added to the Gloomhaven item deck when you hit a new prosperity level. This is another way the game scales and evolves as you play. One of the aspects of the game I really like. Now, speaking of scale, the random dungeon we played on Friday was our first play at scenario level 3, and I've started to notice that while the monsters are getting tougher, they aren't quite getting as tough as our characters are, and I think this is a good thing. I like feeling like leveling up means something, that our characters are becoming more competent. I'm not a big fan of RPGs where the monsters scale exactly with the party, where a fight at level 1 feels the same as a fight at level 10, and I'm pleased to say Gloomhaven does not seem to be falling into this trap. Now there is one big thing that happened last game, and that's that we actually couldn't set up the last room of the dungeon. Based on the card draw and the tiles in my game, we couldn't finish the map. It just didn't work. If we attached it the way the puzzle pieces fit, the room was mirrored and backwards. If we didn't use those, the hexes didn't line up. Now, we were live streaming the game, and Sean saw this, and he started Googling and found in the FAQ that some cards have been printed with flipped art, and that the art should be ignored. However, you can't just ignore it, because it wasn't just the art, it was also the hexes that were different that didn't line up. Interestingly, FAQ listed this as a release one problem, except I own the second edition of the game, so it's not just released one. Now, we were able to eventually keep playing just by setting up the final board mirror to what showed on the card, but I do admit I'm very disappointed that such a big error made it into the second printing of what is a very expensive game. Now, do remember, we stream our Gloomhaven game nights live every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, and you should join us at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletops last week. Saturday, I got some expansions off my pile of shame. First up was Tribes and Prophecies for Zolkin. Zolkin is a fantastic, unique worker placement game and removal game where you are rewarded for patience. The Tribe and Prophecies expansions adds two things to the game. 
The first are the tribes. They give each player a unique power. These powers make the game much more asymmetric than it already was. Now the second part of the expansions is the prophecies part. Now this one really changes up the game feel. There's a new prophecy board, and on it you draw and place three random prophecy tiles. Each of these are horrible things that are going to happen later in the game that players need to plan for and try to mitigate. Now, players that do this well will be rewarded with bonus points. Tribes and Prophecies also adds the ability to play with a fifth player. Overall, I like this expansion, especially the tribes part. I love games with asymmetric player powers. The other two expansions I got played on Saturday were two small card pack expansions for Villages of Valeria, Monuments and Guild Halls. Now, Villages of Valeria is a standalone small box game set in the same universe as Valeria Card Kingdoms. It's a tableau building card game that to me feels like a lighter race for the galaxy with a fantasy theme. The Monuments expansion adds a set of eight monuments to the game. When players hire a hero, they can also start work on a monument. Monuments take a ton of resources to build, but are worth more points than anything else in the game. Now, this expansion also adds four new adventurers that you just add into the base game. Now, the Guild Hall expansion also adds four new adventurers, but in addition, it adds in four new events, which are something new to the game. These are mixed in with the usual building deck, and when they come up, you read them aloud and something happens in the game. Now, the last thing it adds, of course, are the Guild Hall cards themselves. Uh, these look and act just like normal buildings, but add a most style scoring to the end of the game. Overall, I liked both of these expansions. Both were good, and for the price point, I recommend picking both up if you have Villages of Valeria. Now, Sunday afternoon, after picking up report card comics from Rogue's Gallery, our family headed to the coffee exchange. While the kids were reading their comics, my wife and I played another game of War Chest. This time around, we randomized what armies we had, dealing four random unit types to each of us, and man, did that change the game from our previous experience. Overall, I am really digging the mechanics in this game. There were some really interesting and not easy decisions to be made. Like, it's really hard to decide if you should try to get all of your chips into your bag right away, or keep your bag lean so the units you want come up more often. I've also noticed that War Chest really rewards paying attention and remembering exactly what your opponent has in their bag. So far, I am really digging this game, even if the board may be a bit bigger than I would have liked. Now, a week ago Monday, my home game group actually managed to get together and play two games. First up was a medium-length game of Dinosaur Island. Our previous games of Dinosaur Island were played using the short game, and I gotta admit, I was very disappointed in them. I'm pleased to say that the medium-length objectives really fixed my problems with the game. If you own Dinosaur Island and haven't actually played it yet, I strongly recommend swapping to medium-length objectives as soon as possible, possibly just for your first game. Like, I'm surprised how much better the game is by being a bit longer. Now, after Dinosaur Island, Sean Hamilton asked to play Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. He's played the original game many times, but has yet to had a chance to play the new version. Wow, was Sean good at this game? Now, this is Sean Hamilton, my local friend, not Sean from Hamilton on the podcast. Like, for the first time ever, I saw someone complete every single column at least once. He had so many tiles in the bottom row, each scoring multiple times. I've just never seen that before. Now, I've noted this game just doesn't click for me, but man, did it click for him. He destroyed both Deanna and I, beating both of us by over 40 points. We didn't even stand a chance. Now this week, Sean, my podcast host this time, not my friend, not the one I gained with on Monday. I know, too many Sean's. Well, Sean's family finally gave the box of monsters another shot and almost beat it. It was so close. He noted they're getting better each game and victory seems like it's very close. He was also very pleased to report that despite continued losses, his kids aren't getting frustrated, haven't enjoyed the and they have enjoyed the feeling of accomplishment as they get closer each time. Now, Sean's table also saw some DC heroes, but this time with the Crisis expansion, the first one. I was surprised to learn that this expansion swaps the game from a competitive game to a pure co-op deck builder. I didn't realize Cryptozoic had done this. Sean did warn, though, that it is ridiculously hard co-op, much more so than Harry Potter. Hard enough that, in this case, his kids were getting a bit frustrated. He also noted that it's surprisingly long, like two hours long with two players. Though did note that it should get better as they get more experience with the new cards and the new gameplay. Now the last game Sean talked about was Carcassonne. He finally played that for the first time. 
Yes, Sean had not previously played this classic. Now, he played that on Board Game Arena, and despite a bad showing the first game, was impressed by the interface and was able to quickly learn the game through Board Game Arena and is looking forward to more plays. Now, as usual, this weekly look back only scratches the surface. For more discussion about these games and at least one more, check out the full podcast when it goes live Tuesday mornings at 2 a.m. Eastern, both here on YouTube and on your favorite podcatcher. Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the website tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Remember, we record a new episode of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And we'd love it if you joined us in the lobby, our live chat room. Now, if you enjoy the content we're providing, it would be fantastic if you would consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you very much for joining me for this episode of Express Check-In. You can always find us all over the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, or drop by our website, tabletopbellhop.com, for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here. And check out our latest video by clicking over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night, and game on.